Reminder again, your uh, third quiz is a week from today, unless you're taking the Wednesday option. If it's available for those people who have taken both classes, so you don't have two quizzes back to back, or if you're observing Passover and you cannot do it on Monday. But for the rest of you, it's Monday, third quiz. So, yeah. Uh, if one opts to take the quiz on Wednesday, then in the email I said, I read that it's supposed to be online. Is it we, I'll email it to you. So it'll be a list of people. I will email you the quiz. You'll have 30 minutes and you'll email me back the quiz when you're done. Is, that is there also an option to take it in person? How would I man that? Where, where would I find a room for doing that? I mean, in a sense, it's easier for you to find an empty room and take it yourself rather than my finding yeah. a room and having everybody gathered in one place. And... I think I went to return to all your DCFs. I went through the, my perfect DCF, 373, all 373 looked there like they've been answered. I did get astray with a different subject saying my evaluation has not been, I can't even find the evaluation anymore. It's probably 5,000 emails ago. So if you used a different subject, it's gone. So you need to resend it to me with the my perfect DCF. I'm not being a nitpicker. It just puts it in a space where I can find it when I need to. Okay? So today we're going to actually put pricing to rest very quickly because we're almost at the end of pricing and turn to what looks like a third way of doing valuation, which is intrinsic valuation, pricing, and asset-based valuation. A lot, of, a lot of analysts will say, I value kind of, so we'll talk about what that means and why it's not a third way, why it's actually an extension of the first two. So let's talk about asset-based valuation versus value company. In fact, if you think about generically what each of you is doing, value an entire company, right? And each of your companies is actually a collection of different projects or businesses. Some of you in multi-business companies, maybe even a collection of geographies. So one of the things that people think about is, hey, why can't I value each piece separately? So remember how we compute the weighted average equity risk premium of all the geographies you're in? Why not let each geography stand separate? Take you know, Indian revenues, discount them back in Indian rupee with an Indian growth rate and Indian cost of capital. Take Brazilian revenues, discount them. And at first sight, that looks like it should be more precise, right? Breaking things into parts, giving each part its own fundamentals. Is that true though, with the, that, that, that approach is more precise? Why not, Justin? You said like, oh, the debt might be one country. Yes. It's informational, right? It's not just debt. I mean, let's start with, you know, revenues might be broken down geographically, but everything below that is kind of a judgment call made by somebody, right? Other than the direct cause, you have people allocating things across countries. But there is no reason why you cannot value a company as a sum of its parts. 
It's more difficult than it sounds. And I'll take you through what you need in terms of information using United Technologies in 2009. At that time, I called it the poor man's GE. Now it's probably the rich man's GE because it's much better shaped than GE is. But a six business company and talk about valuing each business separately. Clearly, it's much more information intensive to break companies down. But we're going to talk about extending the principle of intrinsic valuation as well as pricing into looking at the sum of the parts. Let's say you do this though. You value a company as the sum of its parts. Then you take each part, add them up. And then you value the company as a combined company. Which of the following will apply? Will the sum of the parts be equal to the value of the company? Will the sum of the parts be greater than the value of the company? Will the sum of the parts be less than the value of the company? What, 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 will, what do you think you will find in your company? As a default, what do you think the, the answer is going to be? What does the fact that your company has stayed a company tell you? At least it's a default. They believe that as a company, they're worth more than the sum of the parts, right? And when they started, that might be true with their peak years, but could that change over the life cycle? And it, there was a time when GE was viewed as more than the sum of its parts. Why great management, amazing, you know, you know the, the centralized everything. In 2004, you took GE, you valued the sum of its parts. GE as a company was worth, worth but that changed over the next decade. And when that changes, you create opportunities. For whom? For people who might take the company over and break it up into pieces, spin-offs, split-offs, divestitures. So we're going to talk about who uses some of the parts valuation, why it can give you an answer different than what you get by valuing the whole company, and when it makes sense to actually value companies by looking at individual cases. Okay, so let's go back and finish up the last vestiges of pricing. I had just done, I think, peg, ratio, peg ratios, and I showed you the regression with the log of the growth rate. Any questions about what we did last session, where we looked at PE, peg ratio, EB, debit, uh, with each one, we defined, we described, we analyzed, we applied. And once we talked about controlling for differences in growth and cash flows and risk using regressions, I opened the door saying, why not look at the entire market? And I looked at PE ratios and peg ratios, at least for US stocks. And as I said, I've been doing this for US stocks going back almost 30 years. I have the regression coefficients over time. They change over time. But starting about 15 to 20 years ago, I started running these regressions, not just for US companies, but for global companies, emerging market companies, European companies. I'm not going to bore you by taking you through each regression, but what I'm going to do in the next few pages is give you the summary of what those numbers, regressions yielded as results at the start of 2024. Now, remember we said you can't you know, have an old regression. This might already be dated given what's happened the last three months, but at the start of 2024, when I regressed PE ratios against beta growth and payout, there's what the R squares look like across the different regressions. You can see that the, the US, the R squared was 34%, global it was 17%. The highest was actually in emerging markets. The biggest, the market where I'm best explain, able to explain the difference in PE ratios. You might say, when am I ever going to use this? You might not have looked at your project recently, but after you've done an intrinsic valuation and after you've priced your company against its peer group, there's a third assignment, and if you might want to look at it, where I ask you to price it against the market. Your first reaction might be, what the heck is he talking about? I'm talking about using this market-wide regression to price your stock. And I'm going to save you the trouble. I don't think you have the bandwidth right now to run an entire market regression. You are welcome to take one of my regressions. Which one you pick will depend on the choice you make. So if you decide that you have an Indian company and you want to use just the emerging market regression, you might use that or you might decide that a global regression works best, pick one of these market regressions, plug in the numbers for your company, for beta growth and payout ratio, and come up with a predicted PE, or whatever multiple you've decided to use. You're saying, what if my earnings were negative? You wouldn't have used PE in the ratio in the first place. Pick the multiple you'd use, EB to EBITDA, EB to sales, because with each of the multiples, you'll see these regressions for the regions. They're all these, uh, these are both on my website and your slides, so you can check them and you get a chance. But I think I've P, peg ratios, price to book ratios, EV to EBITDA, and EV to sales, and EV to investor capital, six different multiples. Any questions on these regressions? 
So basically, they're just market-wide regressions. You notice the coefficients vary across different parts of the world. The R squares vary. Am I going to read too much into them? Not really, because they shift from year to year. It's not like one region consistently gives you the best regressions. A lot of noise in this process. The noise that's part of pricing that we hide from, this kind of brings it out into the open. So let's say you've done all of this and you get to the point where you're going to sit down to price your company. Let's go through the choices you face. First, in terms of value, you have a choice between enterprise value and market cap. Really, that's all. Those are the only two choices you have. Enterprise value will reflect both the debt and the cash. Market cap will reflect this market value of equity. For a scalar, the scalar can be revenues, earnings, cash flow, book value. Which one will you pick first? It depends on how you're measuring value. If you're measuring value to just equity, then your scalar has to be an equity number. That's a consistency principle. But it'll also depend on whether you can find enough positive numbers. So if you're doing PE ratios and half, you lose two thirds of your sample, you might want to rethink using that model. Incidentally, if you're doing a financial service company, stick with equity multiples. There's no such thing as an enterprise value for JP Morgan or Citigroup. Just stay with market cap and scale it to an equity number, equity earnings, equity book value. But basically, it's scale. So you got to pick a, a value to scale it to, a scalar. You might have to make a choice. Do you want to use last year's earnings, trailing earnings, forward earnings, or really forward earnings? And again, that might depend on the company you're looking at. If your company is a young company, you might want to use forward earnings because you need to get some substance on the company. And finally, in terms of comparable, you know, you're going to face lots of choices. Do I want to go with the with the part of the country with the country I'm in, or do I want to glo go globally? Do I want to control for company size? And that might vary across different sectors. In some sectors, you might say, I don't care. In other sectors, company size might matter. And in terms of how big a sample, I'll give you a threshold. If you get to at least 10 companies, you're way ahead. So basically, you're there. But here's the catch. If you're going to run any regressions, the sample size will determine how many variables you can have in your regression. As a rough rule of thumb, with 10 companies, the most variables you can have in regression is one. So don't run a four variable regression if your sample size is stacked. And every 10 companies in addition you add to the sample size, you get the leeway. You don't have to, to add another variables. So if you have 40 companies in your sample size, you can have three or four variables, but if you have 20, stick with two. It's just pure statistical checks. Otherwise you get strange looking output. Let me close off pricing with some general propositions. Yes. Just a question. So we're running the regression. What is the input? Like, for example, we need like the forward, so like either like growth and earnings or like growth and revenue. So you're, but make it clear, you are using forward earnings. It's not a general. So you are going to use forward earnings. Why? Like 40, like 40 companies, say, like, say, so like, where do I get that like, uh, growth number from? Capital IQ is all of them, right? That's that's basically why I made the, the cap without capital IQ, you'll have to collect them individually. Capital IQ it's trivial. It it's it's right there as one of the data items you can download. So you can download forward earnings, you can download forward revenues, forward EBITDA, forward whatever you want, and growth rates. All those numbers are part of the capital IQ database. Well, that, they don't give, they don't estimate the growth. They take a consensus estimate of growth from analysts and report in capital IQ. So that's actually all analysts tracking the company. You won't get a better estimate than that other than you doing it yourself, right? So they don't actually estimate the growth rate. It's actually an analyst estimate that they report the consensus number on. So here's some closing propositions in pricing. In pricing, when you tell me something is cheap or expensive, you always have to specify relative to what? Right? What's a peer group? What's a multiple? So it is a statement about relative pricing. So your pricing judgment can be right, but you can still be hopelessly wrong in terms of value because that every company in your peer group is overpriced. You're going to see that reflected. Second, in pricing, there are no similar companies. You can go looking, but no matter how hard you try, there will be differences on cash flows, growth, and risk, which means you have to find ways to control for those differences. And finally, all of relative valuation is price. It is not valuation. And I know I'm a stickler for this, but let's try to use the word pricing when we do pricing and valuation when we do valuation. Each has its place. Any questions at all about pricing? 
So define, describe, analyze, apply. Let's review. Define, there are two tests, right? Is it consistently defined? Is it uniformly estimated? Describe, put up the distribution, get a sense of high, low, median, 25th. So you know that distribution is not going to be symmetric. Don't use the average. Analyze, go back to that little trick. If it's an equity multiple, go back to a dividend discount model and do the algebra. Not because you're going to use the model to get a PE ratio for your company or a price to book, but because it'll tell you what variables to control for. If it's an enterprise value multiple, go back to the simplest enterprise value model. Free cash for the firm next year divided by cost of capital minus growth rate. Again, the algebra will tell you what to control for when you run a regression, or when you ask questions. And only then do you apply the multiple. Define, describe, analyze, apply. Let's talk about asset-based valuation. So an intrinsic valuation, we value a business based on its characteristics, its cash flows, its growth, its risk, discounted cash flow valuation. In relative valuation of pricing, we put a number on an asset based on what other people are paying for similar assets. In asset-based valuation, you try something different. Rather than value the company, you value the asset. So it's almost very balance sheet focused, right? You can see why accountants like asset-based valuation. It ties in to what they think is the most important financial statement, which is the balance sheet. You're valuing the individual assets, you add them up, and you come up with the value. Those individual assets can be tangible, but they can also be intangible. The entire accounting discussion of how do you value brand name, how do you put up customer lists, is driven by their desire to bring those onto the balance sheet. So let's think about the circumstances under which you might have to do asset-based valuation. First is liquidation. In liquidation, what do you do? You shut the company down, you sell off its assets for the best number you can get. So in liquidation, you almost have no choice but to value the assets, not selling the company, you're selling the assets. The second is an accounting. The 30 years ago in accounting, no accountant cared about value. But over the last three decades, as you well know, there's been this push towards what's called fair value accounting, which I will argue should really be fair price accounting. But basically, they want you to mark to market everything on a balance sheet, which means assets individually have to be marked up. It's not just enough for you to tell me the value of the company has gone up 30%. You have to allocate that value across the assets of the company. And finally, no, so asset-based valuation might be attractive to investors who might be interested in breaking you up, looking at the sum of the parts, either as passive investors where they hope that something good will happen or as activist investors trying to break a company. So let's look at when it's easiest to do asset-based valuation. Asset-based valuation, and, and, and when people talk about asset-based valuation being different from intrinsic valuation of pricing, what they're missing is to value the individual assets, I need a number, right? So when I ask you, what's the value of your factory? You can either come up with that value with an intrinsic valuation, a discounted cash flow valuation, or you can price it. So I think of asset-based valuation still as an application of either intrinsic valuation of pricing, but ultimately that's what's driving it. In some cases, people, of course, trust book value, accounting numbers for those assets. They're all competing for a number to put on. So here are the cases where asset-based valuation is easiest. It's easiest to do in companies where the assets are separable. Your company that owns 12 real estate buildings, you can see why asset-based valuation comes easily, right? You value each building. If I ask you to value Disney as the sum of its parts, it's a nightmare. Because each part seeps into the other one. Disney movies creates revenues for Disney theme parks. Even Disney Plus draws off its movies. When things are not separable, it's going to be much, much more difficult to decide what each individual item is worth. So be more skeptical when activist investors target companies like Disney for the sum of its parts. God only knows how they came up with the sum of its parts, but it's already a more difficult task. Second, it's nice if each part has its own standalone earnings. Right? So even when accountants report earnings by segments, often those earnings are estimated. Disney really has earnings by segment, but those earnings come from accounting. It'd be nice if each asset has its own standalone earnings. That's why, again, real estate is so much easier to do on a sum of the parts because each building has its own rent limit. And finally, to complete the picture, not only is it nice to have separate assets, their own cash flows, it'd be nice if there are similar assets that are out there that are publicly traded, because then you can draw on that information coming up with a number for an asset. 
So with that in mind, let's think about the, diff, the three different scenarios. Let's say you're, you're asked to do a liquidation valuation of a company. First, is your task an intrinsic value task or a pricing task? It's pricing because you've got to sell the damn thing, right? So if you're doing liquidation valuation, don't do DCFs. It's kind of silly to do because nobody's paying you based on a DCF. They're paying you based on what can I get? 12 times earnings, five times EBITDA, it's a pricing. So let's say I take each asset and I'm able to get a pricing for it. I add them all up. If it's truly a liquidation valuation, there's a second concern, which is you've got to sell these all quickly, right? There might actually have to be a discount on the pricing based on what you're trying to sell. If it's something that lots of people demand, maybe the discount will be really small or even zero. But if it's a relatively unique asset, now, if you remember Las Vegas Sands and the liquidation valuation, I basically took the pricing of the casinos and knocked off half, saying there's only two or three potential buyers. They're all going to act like they don't want what you're selling. So it's a pricing with a discount attached. It's, it's relatively straightforward. Nothing from your DCF has to be brought into the arsenal. Let's talk about accounting valuation. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. What do you do in the liquidation tip, say? You have assets where their value is kind of tied in that they're- You sell them as a package, right? Because in a sense, it'll be if you broke them up, they'd be worth less. So you almost have to sell Disney theme parks and movies as a bundle because you try to separate them, you'll get less for individual pieces than you can get as a bundle. So the more entangled things get, the more they have to be priced as a bundle. Let's talk about accounting valuation. I might have told you the story, but when um, about 20 years ago, when- Gap was getting together, right, trying to write the fair value accounting rules. I was, um, they met in New York and the panel was meeting and they said, can you come in and talk to us about valuation? And I said, are you sure you have the right guy? Because I don't think much of you guys. No, so no, come in and talk because you know, we have a lot of accounts. So I said, okay. So I said, can you send me some information on what you're thinking about doing? And they sent me this, this rule called FAS 157. It's a foundational rule for fair value accounting. And I read that, and here's what it said, that the number you should attach to an asset is what a market participant will pay for that asset in an arm's length transaction. Let me repeat that again. That the number you should be attaching to an asset is what a market participant will pay for that asset in an arm's length transaction. That sounds an awful lot like a pricing machine to me. So I showed up and I said, why do you call this fair value accounting? So what are you talking about? If it's fair price accounting. And if it's fair price accounting, what should you be requiring accountants to do? Taking assets, finding peer groups, coming up with a multiple value. Rate. But here was the problem. Fair value accounting rules, GAAP and IFRS, require that you price things and do a DCF to back up that price. Wrong too. And this is what gives rise to frustration on the part of accountants because they do a pricing, they know what the number is supposed to look like. Then they do a DCF, they get a number very different. Say, so what do I do? And they break every rule in intrinsic valuation to make the value converge in the price. Things would be so much easier around the world. Think of how much frustration you'd save at accounting firms around the world. If you just told them, look, this has nothing to do with value. It's a pricing mission. Give us a fair price. A lot more use of data and pricing and multiples than you'd see right now. Be much more reflective of what that is. But the problem right now is you have a split mission. You've told accountants to price things, but then you ask them to use a tool that has nothing to do with pricing. Back it up with the DCF. You've got to change one or the other. Either this is about value and you don't care what a market participant will pay today, or it's a pricing in which case, and this is what drives goodwill impairment and everything else to be what it is. The way goodwill impairment is done right now, it's a pricing adjustment. You bought something for 10 billion five years ago, the sectors dropped 50%. The accountant has to price it down 50%. And that becomes a goodwill impairment that you see on a balance sheet. So I know accountants like to talk about asset valuation, but they too should be really talking about asset pricing given the mission that they're in. So in both liquidation valuation and in accounting, what you're really looking for is pricing, might as well do it right. Which brings me to the third, and this is the richest application of asset-based valuation. You have a going concern. It's in multiple businesses, multiple assets. You can value it in pieces. In fact, to show you how, how far I extend the notion of pieces, if you take a company like Netflix and you can, can you value a Netflix user? 
right? We talked about value. If I can value Netflix user and I multiply by the number of users, I've got a rough measure of how much Netflix's existing users are. I can bring that to play for their new user. So a few years ago, I think six years ago in this class, I valued Netflix on a user base. It's an extension of asset-based valuation because you're starting with units and you're building up to the value of the company. But when you think about some of the parts valuation, you're valuing a company in pieces, whether it's users, whether it's uh, businesses, whether it's geographies. And if you're a long-time passive investor, one way you might use this, if you're a company trading at less than the sum of its pieces, you might argue it's undervalued, that something will happen. You don't know what. You buy the company, then you sit and hope that something good happens. And that something good is usually an activist investor who shows up saying, hey, you'd be worth more than in pieces. And it might not even be the activist investor who breaks up the company. The company often breaks itself up or divests itself. Now, one reason I think now Disney decided to take the step with ESPN that it did, where it created this partnership with them as a prelude to a spinoff is because of the Nelson Peltz pressure on Disney saying, hey, you know what? We've got some valuable parts of the company being dragged down by these not so valuable parts. So both passive and active investors have a role. So let's talk about how to really do some of the parts valuation and why much of what you see there is some of the parts valuation is really some of the parts pricing. Again, I'm going to go back to that distinction. The company I'm going to use, as I said, is United Technologies in 2009. United Technologies was not just in multiple businesses, but they were very different businesses. Here were the businesses. They had Carrier, which was refrigeration systems. Pratt & Whitney, which is a defense company, Otis, which makes elevators, construction company, UTC Fire and Security, very different company and a security company, Hamilton Sunstrand, a manufacturing company, and Sikorsky, which makes the helicopters, aircraft. Six very different businesses. And the reason I picked United Technologies is not because I'm fascinated by the company, but because I actually broke down these businesses into detail that you normally don't get at a regular company. And already you're going to see the foundations for what you need to do some of the parts valuation, if that's what. They actually gave me not just revenues, but EBITDA, pre-tax operating income, CapEx depreciation, and total assets broken down by business. Now, of course, there might be an accountant doing the allocation, but I have at least the raw data in valuing these six companies. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take these six businesses and first price them. You see what that would involve? We've talked about picking the best multiple for your company, right? But if I break a company down to six businesses, I can pick the best multiple for each business separately with a different peer group. And for some of you, this might actually be a way out because you're in three very different businesses. You cannot find a company out there that is in the same three businesses. You can actually get peer groups for each business and add them up at the end. So with each of the companies, this uh, as my first run, I got... The, their, their peer group businesses. And then I looked at the median EV to EBITDA. Very, it's very simplistic. So this think of this as a back of the envelope. You're at a dinner, you're a little drunk, and the person you're sitting with asks you, can you do a sum of the parts valuation of Disney to show how brilliant you are even when you're drunk? You actually ask for an envelope, you put it to the back, and then you write the six businesses down, you take the EBITDA, you have this all in your head, your EV to EBITDA, you came prepared. You apply the multiple, the median, and you come up with an estimated value. You add those numbers up, you have a pricing for United Technologies, basically. You know what? This is what analysts do with some of the parts. This, this envelope, back of the envelope, which you would do when you're half drunk, is becomes a sum of the parts valuation of a company. Tell me what I'm missing when I apply the median multiple for each of the businesses to each you know, each of the in each of the businesses to each part of United Technologies. Or what am I implicitly assuming? Yeah, Synergy. that there are no synergies, right? First, if there are synergies, they're not going to show up, right? So first, that that I can live with because any sum of the parts you have to do it. Yes, uh, capital structures, capital structure, operating margins. Essentially, I'm assuming that each part of United Technologies is very similar to the median company in the business. Is that safe? Maybe, maybe not. How do you know? You got to look across companies, right? So what do we do in pricing to get a better estimate of a multiple for a company when we start using the media? We control for differences in growth and cash flows. In fact, we ran those regressions. Remember, we you know to come up with this is what the multiple should be. So here's what I did. 
I took um, the each of the businesses. I picked a different multiple. And this is the advantage you get when you have six different businesses. EV, I stayed with EV. You know, in general, it's good to pick, in this case, EV and do everything on an EV basis. But by scale, I can be different. I used EBITDA for some invested capital, others, depending on which multiple that I thought best fit the sector. I ran regressions of peer groups for each. So six different peer groups, six different regressions. A lot more work, right? Now do you see why people prefer to value entire companies rather than pieces? But at the end, I got a pricing and I reported the R squares for each of these regressions. I'm going to take these regressions, plug in the peer group, the numbers for United Technologies, because I have the revenues, the operating income, so I was able to plug them in. And I came up with an estimated pricing. So this is also pricing, but think of this as a more sophisticated, if you want to use that word pricing, where you factored in the higher margins or the higher growth that United Technology individual. Did. So now you've got two competitors, 61 billion based on a median multiple and a 75 billion based on both of these approaches, though, miss the fact that when you have a multi-business company, in addition to breaking the company down to businesses, there's a there's an item called corporate costs. You will often see this in companies where basically there's a corporate line item. It has no revenues, but it has expenses attached to it. Think of that as the headquarters, basically, that runs all these businesses. I've kind of ignored them here, right? I've acted like if I break these companies into pieces, that headquarters building can be shut down, everybody can be fired, and nothing happens. It can be a very cynical view of headquarters in general, that they really do nothing, and you send them all home, nothing will happen. But to the extent that they actually do something like, you know, maybe accounting, maybe the generalized marketing, you see what I'm what I'm arguing, right? What, there are two things you can do with corporate that corporate GNA costs. One is you can allocate them across the businesses. The other is you can value it separately as a cash flow item. You're saying, but it has negative cash flows. I can take the present value of negative cash flows and tell you what the value of that is. I call that the corporate value drag in multi-business companies. And I'm amazed at how few some of the parts valuations that I do actually deal with the front. They just ignore it. And it could be a billion dollars. So how can you just make it go away? And just, of course, if some of the parts valuations are going to look better than the company overall, because you've removed a billion dollars in cost. So that's my pricing for United Technologies. Now I'm going to try to do an intrinsic valuation. What do we need for intrinsic valuation? We need cash flows, growth, and rest, right? So first step, I wanted to compute a cost to cap for each of the businesses. If you're in my corporate finance class, this is something we do as part of the class is break company down to businesses, come up with a cost to cap. Yes. Uh, why did you use different scaling variables for every? Uh, you pick the one that works the best, right? How do we pick a good multiple? The one that has the highest star square that you can explain the best. So ultimately the numerator is what gets added up, right? So I can scale it to revenue, scale it to EBITDA, scale it to invested capital. My objective is to get the best estimate of EV of each business, and then at the end, add them up. Okay. I'll tell you the one fly in the ointment is we have a financial service arm for the company. You can't do an enterprise value multiple. We'll talk about what to do with a financial service company. It's got to be almost kept separate. Yes? You can have to take into account like corporate expenses. Well, it takes into account some corporate expenses, but not all. The way they do it, segment EBITDA, the total company's EBITDA, money, but not the segment EBITDA. So when you do the EBITDA, there... If you add up the EBITDA, senior, it won't be equal to the EBITDA for the whole company. It will not. It will not, because there'll be a corporate... That's what the corporate part is. It's kind of a filler. Okay? That's why assuming it away kind of overvalues the company, because it acts like those costs will cease to exist the minute you break the company into its parts. Yes. What if the corporate headquarters has like you know technology or patents that are that's why I don't want to ignore them. You're right. They yeah. they are providing an essential service to these businesses. And to act like they're completely redundant and useless is not just cynical, but it's just it seems to be imprudent because you're eliminating something, right? So the GE headquarters in Stanford. If there, there were people there who did nothing, I would assume, but there are also people who did something that helped the company overall. So that's why I think we need to bring it in. For the moment, I have it, but my intrinsic valuation, I will try to bring it in and then use that same device to adjust my pricing. Yes. I'm in another class and the value 
weeks. Yeah. Would you include SGNA then in the needed fragment? Like somebody else has to assume. Are you valuing the individual properties in the read? Asset value. Right. Would you include like yeah. a certain amount of management costs? Like it has to be absorbed even by an entity that's going to buy. So, first, everybody clear on how net asset values and REITs are computed? They just appraise numbers for building. So, they're pri building pricing adjusted to the current market value. You add them all up, you come up with the net asset value. Are you doing a ratio of the net asset value? Are you actually doing a pricing? But are you do, but across REITs, right? So yeah. they all have that. Implicitly, what are you assuming about SGNA when you just compare price to a net asset value? That the ratio of SGNA, it might be one of the variables you want to control for, right? <laughs> because the companies that are more efficiently delivering that net asset value should be priced higher. But that's a relatively simple fix to make. Because you're not doing a pricing in the sense that I'm trying to do pricing here, where I'm trying to come up with the value per share. You're trying to find the lowest priced number. Okay. So let's do the cost of cap. Yes, go on. What do I, why do I? Because often divisions don't care. If it did matter, I would throw it in. So if they, if they broke down debt by business and I thought the debt ratio made a difference, I would put that in. In most multiples, the debt ratio is kind of a side story rather than the main story. But there's no reason why you shouldn't. In fact, you can take any the num any of the variables we've used in traditional pricing, and if you can get them for the business, that's often the big catch, then you can run the pricing with those variables. In fact, if one of the businesses were in a part of the world where the tax rate is lower, you can bring, that's the advantage of breaking things down by businesses. You can bring in that business's specific characteristics into the mix. So when we do the discounted cash flow valuation, I start with the cost of capital. So to do this by business, what do we need to do? How do we get the beta, uh, the cost of capital for a traditional company? We did a bottom-up beta, right? And many of you I know remember I getting emails from you saying, I can't find companies just like mine because I'm in a mix of four businesses. There isn't another company just like it. That problem goes away when you do it by business because now you have pure place. And you could try to find companies in each of the pure plays. It's more work because you got to get a beta by business, unlever, get an unlevered beta. And I did bring in the debt ratios, which in this case, because they did not tell me how much debt each business carried, I left all the debt ratios of the company's debt ratio. Kind of a cop out, but I could make up debt ratios and didn't want to go there. So they're all capital intensive businesses. I left the debt ratio 23%. As you can see, the cost of capital is lowest for bar and security and highest for Sikorsky, 9.8%. Yeah. Why don't you look at just like the industry comps? You could, but then if the sum of the debt doesn't add up to the debt of the company, then I have a different problem, right? You can imagine that, you know, United Technologies could be an all equity funded company for all you know. So if I decide to allocate the debt, I've got to make sure the sum of the debt adds up to the debt that the company carries. Now, in terms of getting the cash flows, I stuck with very simple models. And my advice to you is if you're doing a sum of the parts valuation, don't build complex models for each one. You're going to drive yourself crazy. I made them all two-stage models. We'll talk about what the stages are. And I computed the growth rate, assuming the margins are stable and all six businesses had stable margins by com coming up with the return on capital and a reinvestment rate. If you have changing margins, you'll have to have a revenue growth and operating margin by business. So you can think of the, the spreadsheet we have and use the same templates for your company. So here, return on capital times reinvestment rate is going to give me a growth rate. That growth rate is very different for the five businesses. It's low as 3.15% for fire and security and as high as 14.19% for Pratt & Whitney. Five different businesses, five very different growth rates. Okay. One of the troublesome things is UTC's return on capital is actually less than its cost of capital. I think the cost of capital is 6.78%. Its return on capital is less than the cost of capital. So if you're an activist looking at the company, you, you already know in terms of good to bad businesses, which ones are your best, most value creating, which ones are the most value destructive. Which is one reason in corporate finance, you should be doing this on a regular basis. Not like you're planning to break the business company down, but because you need to understand which of the companies are creating value for you, which of the businesses are creating value and which ones are destroying value. So essentially every one of the companies are used a two-stage model. In fact, for fire and security, the growth rate is too low. 
I just make them made them a stable growth business. Again, you can do that because you have five, six different businesses. You're not required then to pick one growth pattern for every company. So you get more flexibility in your inputs, but with it comes more inputs. Six times the number of inputs you'd have to value one company. So I value do a DCF valuation of each of the different segments. I add them all up. I come up with an intrinsic value of the six parts of 80.25N. So at this point, I have a pricing based on just using medians of 61 billion, which I dismissed as probably too unsophisticated. A pricing based on regressions that catch the differences in this company of 74 point something billion and an intrinsic valuation of 80.25 billion. I still have debt with the corporate GNA in any of these, but I have three competing numbers based on how I approach the sum of the parts. Now let's talk about corporate GNA. United Technologies at 408 million in corporate GNA in the year that I did this valuation. It's going to grow. I'm going to keep things simple, assume it grows at, uh, at a stable growth rate. I have the cost of cap for the entire company, 8.68%. I take the present value of those corporate costs in perpetuity. I get a value drag of 4.6 billion. What does that mean? When I buy this company, that drag comes with the company. If the company ceases to exist, the costs are going to go to the different businesses. I don't know where, so I just take the present value of the total drag. Now, so if you prefer to allocate, be my guest, but I, I think it saves you the trouble of having to make decisions on, do I allocate based on assets? Do I allocate based on revenues? It just basically takes that out of your hands and say, this is the value drag created. My intrinsic valuation, I subtract the value drag. Is everybody clear why I'm subtracting out? That's a corporate cost I have to bear. I come up with an intrinsic valuation of 75.67 billion. My pricing, I came up with, you know, with 74 and 61 billion, the 61 I'm not even showing. I actually valued United Technologies as a company. And the value that I got was 71 billion. Would I buy out United Technologies to break them out? No, not at this value, but the actual enterprise value is 52 billion. I don't even need a breakup. It's undervalued on so many different dimensions. You know? I mean, this was right after the 2008 crisis. United had been slaughtered. The price had been slaughtered. You were getting it at a bargain price. And whether you valued it or priced it, it just looked incredibly cheap. Any questions on some of the parts valuations? David? So here it's undervalued compared to the DCF and some of the parts. Everything. Oh, it's so pricing. Is it just fast? Isn't it just easier to buy it and sell everything? But it was 2009. That the catch is in 2009, everybody was terrified, right? Nobody was. Nobody wanted to be an activist. They were worried about you know trying to sell things in that market. So in hindsight, it would have been a great choice to make. But my question is more: Isn't breaking it up easier just because you get back your liquidity much faster as opposed to relying on the assumption? If you do, if you factor out that breaking it up in 2009 would have been messy. Right. No, there are lots of ways you could have made money here, but I think that you know people were holding back because they were concerned about the debt and what would happen in 2010. In hindsight, we know things improved, but there was a very real chance in 2009 that things would crash and burn. Yes. Um, like three so like all three different vectors, we write that value is actually above the enterprise value. So it led us to the choice is okay, like this company is actually under right. value. But what if we arrive at three different uh, three different values? What are the pre let's put the pricing to one side of the value to the other side? Let's say the value had given you a higher value than the current value, and the pricing had given you lower numbers. Is that the question you're asking? What should I do? Yeah, exactly. What's your plan with the company? Are you planning to take it and run it or you take, plan to take it and sell off the sum of the parts? That's why I'm asking you because you are the one who said you want to take this. So what are you planning to do with the company, right? Because my answer will depend on what you plan to do with the company. If you plan to, to buy it and break it up today, the pricing matters, right? If you plan to buy it and create Spin-offs where basically you create six. Remember, you don't have to sell. You basically have to create these into six independent businesses. 
which is what you do in spinoffs. You create six independent companies. You give the shareholders their share of each of the six companies. There you run them as going concerns. There you might say, I care about the intrinsic value. I'm not planning to sell the business. That's why I need to know when an activist approaches the company, what is your end game? If you plan to buy it and sell it today, it's a pricing game. If you plan to buy it and break it up into pieces and keep the pieces as going concerns, the intrinsic value enters the picture. In fact, if you know spin-offs, split-offs, divestitures, this becomes the kind of you know, lens through which you can say, when does it make sense for a company to be broken up into parts as opposed to divesting individual items? Because it's a pricing versus a value choice. Now think about your company, and I want you to think about breaking. I mean, many of your companies are multi-business companies, right? You're doing Lulu Lamont. It's an apparel business. And there's that mirror business. God only knows what that mirror business actually is all about, right? Have you heard about the mirror business? It's like a Peloton kind of, you know, you, I don't know what you do. I've never been in front of a Lululemon mirror. I'm dying to see what it actually looks like. Maybe right. it's one of those uh, magic mirrors that, you know, you don't have to take Ozempic. It just takes a fat person and makes them look like a slim person. I don't know whatever it is. But there was talk, at least at the height of the Peloton craze, that they were going to create a subscription model. It's kind of died down. Yeah. Company like that, I wouldn't do some of the parts because you you got a, a part that actually creates value, another part like an experimental part. This is more for a company that is in multiple businesses and you want to look at the businesses separately because you think they might be going in different directions. Right? Can you do this with a geographical breakdown? Can I take Coca-Cola and absolutely, right? In fact, I could use different currencies for each geography if I wanted to. Could bring in different characteristics. In the US, Coca-Cola might be a declining company because people are drinking less sugar drinks. But maybe in Latin America, it's still a high growth business. The advantage you get when you break companies down is you get, get that chance of having different business have different characteristics, which right now I'm forcing you to to do it all one revenue growth and one margin. No. But it comes with the cost of now you've got to run the FCFF simple Ginzo model twice if you have two businesses and three times. But it's really the same model being replicated with the individual pieces as long as you have the information. You can do it. I, I'm sorry about the colors. In hindsight, this is kind of gives me a headache just looking at the colors. In 2018, G was hitting kind of rock bottom. You know? And um, new CEO had come in, talk is where does G go now? And by then G had actually slimmed down. It used to be in 26 businesses. Imagine doing a sum of the parts valuation in 2004. It was down to maybe nine businesses or eight businesses. You're saying why the different colors? The green are the businesses where they're earning a return on capital higher than the cost of capital. The yellow are the business where they're earning roughly their cost of capital, and the red are the two businesses where they're earning less than the cost of capital. So essentially, I broke the eight business down into good, neutral, and, and bad businesses. And I valued each business. Now, part of you is saying, why didn't they just shut the bad businesses down? We'll talk about wh why that was not even possible, because the worst business was the GE Capital business. In fact, when I did my intrinsic value, you know, when I did the intrinsic valuation, the intrinsic value, va valuation I got for GE Capital as a business was 27 billion and it owed 51 billion in debt. So by itself, what is it doing? It's reducing your enterprise value by 24 billion. So why didn't they just shut it down? I mean, it's been a pain now for almost seven years. Why couldn't they shut it down? Yeah. Maybe that brings in for business lines. GE Capital was backing up the GE aircraft sales to customers. It, could, it was entangled in every other business. Every other business had some aspect of they could not separate it. Now, it, this was Jack Welch's crowning glory, right? He made GE Capital one of the largest financial service companies in the world. But in the process, he created the seeds for GE's destruction. Because as it climbed, it pushed the company up to being the largest market cap company briefly about 20 plus years ago. But on its way down, it took everything down with it. G without G Capital would have had a longer life, not a glorious life, but a longer life. G Capital essentially speeded up that. Something companies should take into account when they build a financial service arm is it's great when you're growing, but then it starts to crimp you as you shrink because 
of all the entanglements created by it. So my intrinsic valuation, I followed exactly the same path that I did for United Technologies because GE2 breaks things down by business. You know? Not as well as United Technology, I'm quite honest, but well enough that I could do this for individual businesses. In fact, my GE, my GE value, intrinsic valuation gave me a value of $11 per share. My GE pricing gave me a value of about $12 per share. The stock again was trading at about eight or nine because there was so much bad news coming out about the company. This is not the company where you buy to expect to quadruple your money. It's the kind of company where you hope it digs itself enough out of the ground that the $8 becomes 15 or 20. And then you just walk away saying, this is not a long-term investment for me, but it's made it back to where it should be. So many, I mean, I, I remember at the same time that this happened, Sony was targeted for some of the parts acquisition. And my reaction is not going to happen at Sony because it's not a company where you can easily break the parts down. So not separable. So next time you see a company target for some of the parts, pass it through there. Are the assets separable? Do they have their own cash flows? And is there a market for it? And the answer is no, no, and no. And at some of the parts process, it's not going to get very far because you have too many entanglements in the way. Any questions at all about asset-based valuation? This is a balance sheet based approach. So be careful not to double count, right? Because increasingly on balance sheets, what are you saying? Values are what accountants call intangibles, right? Brand name, customer list. If you're doing an asset-based valuation, those are truly not assets. They're just separations of things that are in other businesses separate as assets. And this is why I think fair value accounting is kind of heading for a crash. Because again, they're not thinking about what happens as you bring these items off from the other assets and you leave the other assets to be valued, you're going to end up double counting the same items. Imagine valuing Coca-Cola as a company and then valuing Coca-Cola's brand and adding the two up. That's where we're heading when we start to put intangibles on the balance sheet. Would, yes? So when you're valuing this company, would you put like a, a value on the management team like, and it'd be a negative value as long as you're open to the fact that management can destroy value as much as it can add it. I'm okay with it. It's already in there, right? But it's part of like the thesis is that that guy makes this happen. And make the thing. check, then go in with him on his medical test to make sure he is. I mean, any, this is actually, I'm not being facetious. Anytime a company's value comes from a personality, that value is a lot more shaky than a, com than a value that comes from some other competitive advantage. Why? Because you know, managers are human beings. Yes. Anything that happens to them then becomes an effect on value. It's always been my worry with Tesla. Right? When you're looking to buy that company, how would you value that asset which is in? Well, is he going to stay on? It's called a key person discount, which is you pay for the company based on what you think will happen to that key person or people, right? Because they're going to walk out of the door the minute you buy the company. That company is worth a lot less. So I'd actually do two valuations. One with, the, and it's not just the top people. It could be research people, we are a technology firm. If they're all going to leave, see this in financial service firms. I mean, I remember when, um, when um, um, Michael Price sold this mutual fund to the Japanese. They paid the price for the fund. And when they walked in, every fund manager had moved on. They walked in an empty building. What's a fund worth when all of the people who used to run the funds are gone? I don't know. So it's a key person issue, but it's again an intrinsic value issue. You have to value the company. You're buying a restaurant with a well-known chef, right? You value twice, once with the chef and once with a lesser chef. A Gordon Ramsay might get your revenues up 25%. It does mean you got to estimate what that person does. Right. I mean, yeah. don't you? bring it into the cash flow. It is in there, but the question is, it is in there, but that person is a person. So in a sense, you got to ask, you know, what if after I value the company and buy the company, that person leaves? So you at least need to be aware of what the company would be worth without that person, right? How would you put a dollar amount to that person? Like, without. It, no. I mean, the fact that you think that person matters means that you think it's going to show up in the numbers. It's going to be the growth, the margins, or the reinvestment, right? It's one of those three numbers you got to show up. It's, it's got to show up in. And I think it, you know, as companies get larger, hopefully that person effect will get smaller. If it doesn't, then you're in trouble. 
in, um, I mean, let's face it, in 1986, was Bill Gates critical to Microsoft? Absolutely. But you know why, why? I don't like Microsoft, but I admire Bill Gates for what he did. He made himself redundant over the next decade. So when he walked out of Microsoft that day, what is it, 97, 98, and he said, Steve Ballmer is my CEO, Microsoft stock price did nothing because by then, and that is what good founders do is they make themselves redundant. Now, and I think that's tough to do, right? It's your baby. You want to be involved. I mean, the, it then creates this problem. Now, value the company. I've got to factor in how old are you? How, what's your health look like? Have you had any rehabs recently? All of those things start to play into my valuation. That's not a good place for any company to be. In fact, I have a blog post on key person valuation. You get a chance. You can you can check it out because it is it is an issue, especially with smaller companies. It's a big issue. In fact, in small company valuation, we'll talk about this. We'll talk about a key person discount. No. Yeah, question back there. Yeah, if companies are, they have assets that are less like entangled, do they still tend to sell higher premium because you can just sell it off? Probably, right? At least for, because it's easier to break the company up. Yeah. But let's face it, the entanglements are what we call synergy, right? That's the, so in a sense, entanglements are not necessarily bad things. Those entanglements are what create the synergies. The more synergies you create, the more entanglements. You, so it's almost a trade-off. Would you prefer to run separable businesses which have no synergies? Or you want to build this integrated? The whole idea of integrating a company is often to create those synergies. So I wouldn't think of it as a bad thing that they're entanglements because the entanglements also have cash flow effects. David? I feel like the poor, smaller company, the sole revenue, how big the revenue is, how big the market cap is, might be correlated to the PE uh, or the EV to EBITDA right. uh, multiple. Yeah, that also or later, which direction, positive or negative? Positive. So, like the higher. Because and why? And tell me what fundamental allows it to happen. I can see a scenario where that could. I could also tell you a counter story where the opposite happens. Mm -hmm. Tell me your story for why. Smaller com as companies get larger, the EV to EBITDA will go up. Okay, so so potentially somebody could buy them out because, but wouldn't it be easy to buy three small companies and one larger company? Would would you argue that being small actually makes it easier for people to acquire? Yes, but I feel like investment funds would probably have only the targets. Okay, so that's uh, it, it, there could also be the fact that. Um, I mean, to the extent their economies of scale as companies get bigger, there are there are operating margin effects, obviously. There's a survival. Remember, the failure rate gets smaller as companies get bigger. You know, a million dollar startup has a much greater chance of failing than a billion dollar startup. So my my advice is whenever you there, there's, there's a there's a thesis, think about where in your valuation it's going to show up. And I can think of places where it show up. I that's why I said I could tell you a counter story where as companies get bigger. The, the they they get less efficient. Growth starts to come down because you've scaled up. So I could tell a different story. So I guess it would depend on the sector you're looking at and whether scaling up actually helps you. And you could come up with different conclusions. Yeah. Let's talk about valuing private companies. I mean, so far every company I valued has been a publicly traded company or a company on the verge of going public, right? But you know there are ten times more valuations of privately owned businesses than public companies. Many are small, you don't notice them. The doctor's office you walk into, every time a doctor gets old, they used to sell their medical practice to another doctor. Okay. And the question is, what's different about valuing a private business? Let's talk about what's what's the, what's common. Value, the intrinsic value, you can either value or price a private business, just like a public company. The value of a public of a private business is the present value of its expected cash flows adjusted for risk. That stays the same. Now the risk adjustment might vary, but the principles of valuation don't change just because you're valuing a private business. But there are two key things that separate privately owned businesses from public companies. First is there is no market value out there. You think who cares? You're going to see how how much you don't probably realize how much you dependent on ha having a market value when you value a publicly traded company. But I'm going to take it out. And you're going to see how much you start to miss. Okay. And the second is financial statements for private businesses, especially when they get to be really small private businesses. The accounting principles start to get I don't know the right word a little looser in terms of and so more variance. 
So let's start with this no market. Yeah, go on. So when we said that there's no market value for the uh, business, imagine there's a startup and there are TPD investors who will not call the previous round of funding as the market value. Of Remember, what's the end game for a startup that's attracting venture capitalists? What 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 do they plan to grow and reach those things? And then, what's the definition of success for a VC? You invest in a VC, you exit. You exit by the, no startup in a space. So things like tech startups are really not privately owned business. They're public companies in waiting with a lot of probabilities before they get there. So when you talk about valuing young startups, I'd value them just the same way I value a publicly traded company because many of the issues we're talking about here are not there. There the VC pricing becomes the pricing of the company with one caveat. With VC pricing, the pricing is not every day, right? It's whatever the last round is. The last round was six months ago. The pricing is going to get staler and staler. So it's going to get more and more difficult to get updated pricing. So there too, you might run into this market cap issue because there's nothing you can compare to today. Let's think about all the places we use market cap in intrinsic valuation for a publicly traded company. First, we use market values as inputs. Where? In a cost of capital, the weights have to be market value weights, right, to get started. When we value options, we need the market price to get the value of the option. So if I take those out, then you say, what the heck do I do? What's my starting cost of capital? Second, when we value a company, I don't know about you, the first thing you naturally look at after you come up with the value per share, you might have been glancing at it all along the way, but you no, know, when you value a share, what's the first thing you check it against? Check it against the market price. And if it's 100 times the market price, what do you do? You say, I screwed up somewhere. Let me go back and redo it. It's nice to have a market price value. You missed it. You know? You'd use thousands instead of millions. So we use market price as inputs, market price as outputs. We even use market prices to get our risk measures, right? Beta comes from running a regression. Run a regression, we need market prices. When I take market price away, it's not just another input, it's a central number that we are dependent on when we value companies. And losing that number kind of makes us feel rudderless. And we'll talk about what. The second is this cash flow issue. The definition of a cash flow is no different for a public company than a private business. Free cash flow to the firm is after tax operating income, minus net capex, minus change in working capital is free cash flow to the firm. But let's think about what makes private company assessments a little messy. First is most private business, not all of them, have shorter histories than public companies. Though the oldest privately owned business, or the oldest company in the world was actually a privately owned business. It's a Japanese company that made shrines. It was 2000 years old when it finally went out of business just a couple of decades ago. But they stayed focused on one business. They just did shrines and temples in Japan. They were really good at it, no? but they said, but most private companies, the history is smaller, so you don't have, so you can't go to capital like you say, give me the last 20 years of revenues, might not be there. Second, you know, we talked about accounting standards being different. As private companies get bigger, the accounting standards do start to converge on public companies. That's another reason why I'd pay a higher multiple of EBITDA for a larger company than a smaller company. But for really small private businesses, the accounting standards can be really squishy. I remember somebody from this class about 10 years ago decides to value their mother's flower business. Mother ran a flower business, small store, so, you know. And about five weeks into the semester, she came and said, I've got to change my business. I said, why are you not getting along with your mom? What's, what's going on? She said, I went and asked her for her financials. And she took me into a back room where the walls were covered with post-it notes, one wall at you know, blue, one. And I said, mom, what is this? And she said, this is my accounting room. Whenever I have a revenue, I post it on a re See, she had at least a system. The post-it notes were different for revenues and expenses. And she said, at the end of the year, I pull them all down and I do my accounting. I don't know where post-it accounting fits in the larger scheme of accounting standards, but I don't think as a company, you can do post-it accounting. So I lost the post-it notes, sorry, a couple of billion. Third, there is this intermingling of the personal and the business. It happens all the time. With private businesses, that company car magically seems to leave at 3.15 in the afternoon just as school is letting out to pick up the owner's kids. That company credit card 
it's been used to go to Disneyland a couple of times again. You know, the, the, and it's not because they're being trying to, to cheat, but because you can't maintain that absolute separation. And finally, the, in a, and as part of that, you also in privately owned businesses sometimes see people. So what does that person do? I have no idea, but they have the same last name as the owner. I call this the George Costanza. In all my years of watching Seinfeld, I never figured out what George did for the Yankees. There's one episode where I think he changed the uniforms to polyester. It didn't go well. But what exactly? There are these employees. What exactly does that guy do? I have no idea. And finally, and this is critical. If you're the owner of a private business, do you spend a lot of your time at that business? Pretty much all day, right? What do you do? Pretty much everything. You're the janitor, you're the, you know, you're the accountant, you're the inventory keeper, you're the HR person, if you want to call yourself that. But you don't pay yourself a salary. Why not? What's the point? It's all going to come to you at the end. But that creates a problem when you're valuing a private business. Do you see why? Because the, the owner can give me his or her financials. They can look great. I'm making 150000 a year. You get ready to pay for the company based on the earnings. And then you ask the owner, how much time do you spend again each day? About 18 hours a day. Right? How many people would it take me to replace what you do? Probably three people. That 150,000 is down to zero. Yeah. In, in, on Shark Tank, you'll often see this is one of the questions asked, do you pay yourself a salary? The reason they ask that is otherwise they report that income. I made 65,000 last year working 18 hours a day. That's like minimum wage by the time you're done, right? If you don't pay yourself. So we have to talk about how to bring those up. So when you think about private company valuation, those two issues are going to float around that no market cap and the fact that you have these different accounting standards. So let's say you ask me to value a private company. Before I even value the company, I'm going to ask you, why do you want to value? You say, what do you mean, why do I want to value? Here are some of the reasons. You might just be curious. You own a company, you're not planning to sell it. You know, how much is this worth? I've spent the last 20 years here. Or it might be because you're getting divorced and your soon-to-be ex-spouse is going to get half of it. So think of these as show valuations. Nothing happens other than that there's something that comes out of it. You could be valuing this kind of this business for a transaction because you want to sell the business. You can sell it to another, to another individual. You can sell it to a firm. Or you can sell it to a partner. Remember, if you have a partnership business, one partner can sell. So it could be for that reason. It's a transaction. Or it could be as a prelude if you're a large enough company for an initial public offering. With public companies, we never ask the question, why, right? Motive doesn't matter because in a sense, it is the same no matter why I do it. In the case of private businesses, when you ask me to value the business, I need to know why because I can give you very different numbers depending on why. Incidentally, these this private business issue is not just restricted to private businesses. If you ask me to value the division of a company that's going to be spun off or sold, I have faced the same challenges. Divisions don't have market caps. How do I come up? So these issues are going to show up any time you don't have a standalone public company. So what I'd like to do is take you through four different scenarios. I'm going to start with the most complex one, a private to private transaction. I have a private business. You're a private individual. You're thinking about buying my business. We'll talk about how to value business for a private to private transaction. That's the most difficult. And then I'm going to talk about a much easier scenario, private to public transaction, where you're a private business, I'm a public company, I'm thinking of buying you. Why things get much easier when it's a private to public. Third, I want to talk about private to IPO. Again, much simpler than private to private and what's involved in an IPO. We have to bring in the specifics of how IPOs are structured and what they do. Yeah. And that adds a couple of layers of detail, but not that many. And finally, I want to talk about a sequence where you start as a privately owned business and then you become partly owned by venture capitalists before you go public. So I almost think of it as three steps. So let's start with the private to private transaction. In private transactions, private to private transactions, you're one individual owning a business who's trying to sell to another individual who wants to buy the business. It's not always the case, but three things will generally be true. One is neither the buyer nor the seller is going to be diversified. You see why? You're a doctor. You've spent the last 40 years building a medical practice. Every dollar that you have goes into that practice. You might not have much in outside savings. 
you're not going to be diversified as the seller. The buyer is not diversified. We'll talk about why that's going to become a significant part of your valuation. You can start thinking already, why does it matter whether the buyer is diversified or not? Where is it going to show up in evaluation? And you can very quickly see where it's going to trace out, but we'll come to that. Second, once you make that investment as a buyer, you buy a private business, it's a liquid, right? Let's say before you came into class today, you bought NVIDIA because Jim Cramer likes it. And after the class is done, you decided it was a terrible idea. It's still 3.30, you, 3 o'clock, the market hasn't closed, you sell NVIDIA. Reversing a mistake in the public markets is not costless, but it's relatively costless. But if you decide to buy the neighborhood, you know, the, the corner, corner deli grocery store that's right on what bleaker is on, in a moment of weakness, you stop, you take your entire family savings, you buy that business, you get home, you tell your spouse what you did, and he or she says, what the heck did you do? Go back and sell it. And you imagine sitting, standing at the corner and said, you want to buy this corner store, I bought it by mistake. So you know what happens, where because it's a liquid, as a buyer, you will hold back on how much you pay. It's called an illiquidity discount. You're already thinking about, what if I change my mind? So the investment is illiquid. And finally, this is the point that Isaac made, which is when you buy these small private businesses, even that corner grocery store, the guy who sits behind the stands behind the counter might be central to its success. He might know the right suppliers. The customers might come in because they like him or dislike him, whatever the reason is. Yeah. So those are three issues, not specific, but most likely to happen. Yes. Shouldn't you argue a lot of this? Uh, the buyers are diversified into like e firms. Are... That's why this is a private to private, private to public, or private to VCs. The buyer starts to get more diversified. Not so. It's not a zero or one, right? It's not a continuum of diversified, not diversified. Think of it as a continuum. So, At one end, you have somebody who takes all their wealth and buys this company, business. At the other end, you have somebody who's a diversified investor. With IPOs and public companies, you're at the other end. That's why I said they get easier because you can do the same things you do with traditional public companies. So you wouldn't say like a private firm? Okay, so they're going to fall in the middle, right? So, and even between those firms, you can see differences. You take a PE firm like you know, Blackstone, or KKR versus a smaller PE firm. Oh, so yeah. basically we'll talk about what it is that gives Blackstone and KKR an advantage over a small PE firm. It all comes down to this diversification continuum. So this one, I'm gonna take one end of the spectrum, completely undiversified. In the public company, I'm gonna take the other end of the spectrum, which is completely diversified. And then when I talk about VCs and PE, I'm gonna go right down the middle and say, where do you fall? Because that's gonna allow us to talk about ranges of diversification. So those are issues, not just specific to private businesses, but more likely to show up with private to private transactions. So here's the valuation I'm going to do. I'm going to value a restaurant. A restaurant with a well-regarded chef, a named chef. Right? Then you are an investment banker. You're my potential buyer. You're sick and tired of the drag, working six to 10 every day. So you always wanted to own a restaurant. So you cash out, you take all of the savings you've accumulated as an investment bank, assuming you have, and you buy the restaurant. So already I've laid the foundations. You're going to be completely undiversified after you buy this. And I give you access to my financial statements. I've been a pretty successful restaurant. It turns out that I've reported $1.2 million in revenues, 400000 in pre-tax operating profit, and I'm pretty much at capacity. What does it mean? Every table is pretty much sold every day. And essentially when you buy the restaurant, you're hoping that you can continue to do what I do. The firm has no conventional debt outstanding. The restaurant has no convention, but it does have a lease commitment. And this was before lease commitments are treated as debt. And for private companies, it's still often treated as operating expenses of 120,000 a year for the next 12 years. The question is, how much should you pay to buy the restaurant for me? So let's start the process. There are my past financial statements. I'm treating lease expense as an operating expense, like everybody else is. And I'm reporting operating income that has gone from 180 million to four, I'm sorry, 180,000 to 400,000 over the last two years. And net income that has gone from 108 to 240,000, but I'm now filled up, right? So I can't, remember, I can't put in a 30% growth rate in a private business because it's a restaurant. 
I can't start to put chairs in the kitchen and say, you know, go sit in the kitchen with the chef and they'll feed you there. I mean, the restaurant is full to capacity. And if I want to build a second restaurant, we can talk about franchising it. So there are extensions you can use, but for the moment, I'm just valuing the restaurant. Now, the first thing you can, we, can, we need to do is come up with a discount rate to use to discount the cash flows. Remember, when we use betas and go, going back all the way to session three, when we talked about risk and return, we made a leap of faith. The leap of faith is the marginal investor in a company is diversified. And therefore, what do we do? We focus only on the risk you cannot diversify away. We measure that with the beta. And we bring that beta into our cost of equity. That is now in shambles. That assumption cannot be made. You see what? Who's the marginal investor here? The buyer. The extreme opposite of diversify. They're going to take all their wealth and put it into this business. So let's think of direction. As the buyer of this business, because you're not diversified, if I gave you a beta-based cost of equity, what's your reaction going to be? Too low. Right? I'm facing all this other risk. And if I tell you about the diversifiable, non-diversifiable, you're going to say, what diversifiable, non-diversifiable? More wealth is all tied up in the business. I'm the exact opposite of diversity. So I need to adjust the beta for the fact that if all this other risk that I'm now acting as if it's going to get diversified. And this is a plain algebra problem. I remember the first time I did this was in 1992 after I went to an appraisers conference. These appraisers value only private business. They say, How do you deal with the fact? Because they get all their numbers from public companies, right? That, that's where the data is. And they said, what do you do with the fact that your buyers are not diversified? And here's what they said. They said, they said we take the risk-free rate plus beta times risk premium, the cap M, and then we add 10%. And they said, why? So because we want a higher cost of equity. They said, why 10%? Because that's what we've always done. That didn't work for me. So here's the way I'm going to think through the, 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 the beta you will face as a potential buyer. I started doing what I do with the public company. I went and got the betas for other publicly traded restaurants. And you know, you could argue that maybe if you're an upscale restaurant, I don't want to be using you know, TGI Friday and McDonald's as my sample. I actually switched midway through the peer group and said, I'm going to use you know, high-end retailers because the people who eat at high, you know, upscale restaurants tend to also shop. You know, this notion of a peer group, we tend to be very focused on sector. I mean, it's really focused on who buys our products and services and what else do they buy? The unlevered beta that I came up with for these retailers was 1.1. Now, if this were a publicly traded company, what would I do? I'd get the debt to equity ratio. Already a problem because I have no market debt, but let's say I would, for a public company, I should. I would lever this beta up and that would become the beta I use for the cost of equity. So I'm gonna leave you with this page because this kind of captures how I thought through the problem. Right. Basically, if you think about all the risk in a company, some of it is non-diversifiable risk. Where does non-diversifiable risk come from? What are the sources of non-diversifiable risk? What's the definition of non-diversifiable? It affects most companies at the same time, right? Interest. It's got to be some kind of a macro risk, not a micro risk because it affects most companies. It could be interest oh, rates, inflation. risk, yes. Yeah. Non-diversifiable risk has to come from macro forces. Diversifiable risk will be risk that a company's manager might leave the job, might become an alcoholic, who knows all the different things. You know, those are the diversifiable risks. If I have publicly, if my marginal investors are diversified, I focus on the non-diversifiable risk. So beta captures this non-diversifiable risk. So when I run a regression, what you see as a beta, if you trust the Bloomberg beta, that beta captures only the black portion of the risk. But what did I say about the potential buyer? He or she is completely undiversified, right? So not only do they face the black portion of the risk, they face the rest of the risk as well. Wouldn't it be nice if I could tell you what percentage of the risk in this company is non-diversified? Take a look at the, the beta regression and tell me whether there's a statistic there that's going to help me on that count. I want to figure out you know, what percentage of the risk in a rest, publicly traded restaurant comes from the market. What do you say? The R, the R, the first, in the, if you look at the beta regression, there is an R squared and an R. 
basically that captures the R squared, captures the partial variance, the R captures the correlation. So here's what I did. In addition to collecting the betas for the restaurants, I also collected the R, the correlations. It's public companies, so I can get them. And that gives me a sense of how much of the risk in this company. So let's suppose, let me make up a number. Let's suppose the, the average R across the companies is 0.4. And the beta is one. Help me out here. If I'm a diversified investor, the beta one captures my risk, right? Because I'm exposed to only the 0.4, which is. But if I'm a completely undiversified investor, what kind of beta would it look like I'm exposing myself to with those statistics? So 0.4 works out to one, and I'm exposed to all of the risk. My beta will look like it's. 2.5, you see the scaling up, I'm bringing in the rest. It's basically the beta divided by the correlation. I call that a total beta. It's nothing fancy. I'm bringing in total risk rather than market risk. And I'm gonna argue that if you're completely undiversified, that total beta is going to drive your cost of equity. Earlier you talked about VCs, they'll fall, Their cor the correlation you look at there is not the correlation you see with the company, but the correlation of their portfolios with the market. And the more diversified they get, guess what happens to that correlation? It's going to move up towards one. And if you're a KKR Blackstone, you can use public company. Yeah. And that's almost inexorable. I will predict that the private equity business increasingly is going to either go public or get subsumed by public, because you can't compete head to head against somebody who's more diversified than you on a systematic basis and expect to work. So when we start on Wednesday, we're gonna complete private company value. David? Yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the rest of private company valuation, but I will see you on Wednesday. Yeah. Oh, I am sorry that they have to they have to invest to recreate themselves. Not even the new growth. I'm going to go ahead and 